<sighs> How's everybody's Christmas? Is it good? Mine was good. Had to pull out a size bigger than the jeans this morning. <laughs> I was like, Megan, too good of a Christmas. <laughs> like, tone it down. <laughs> um, I'm so excited to be able to share with, with my church this morning. Um, I'm super honored. Anybody who has been in leadership, especially, especially pastoral leadership, knows it's kind of scary letting people preach in your church sometimes, right? You don't know sometimes what they're going to say, and even more, I mean, I'm sure that our beloved pastors are listening in today, but still, no one's here to jump up and be like, heresy, sit down, you know? So I'm super honored <laughs> and really blessed. I'm so thankful for this opportunity. This is the first time I've uh, spoken since we got back from Venezuela, so super excited to to be here so thank you so much to our pastors for this wonderful opportunity um and thank you guys for you know listening not that you have a lot of choice but you know <laughs> um let's pray before we get started dear lord i thank you so much for your goodness I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you that you speak to us, that you're moving, that you're alive, that you are not sitting quietly by watching what is happening in our lives, but you are actively involved in our lives. Holy Spirit, you are moving in us and through us, and you are speaking to our hearts. So I pray this morning that you would open our spirits, open our spiritual ears and our spiritual eyes to see and hear and understand what it is that you are speaking to us and what it is you are wanting to do in our hearts and in our lives today as individuals and as a body of believers. And I pray that you would give me clarity of mind as I share what you've laid on my heart today. And I thank you. Thank you for your presence. <laughs> we love you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm gonna try really hard to hunker down in this area so my husband does not like shoot arrows at me. <laughs> I'm kind of like a mover, you know? So <laughs> my husband's like, there's the window, stay in it, Megan, right? So I'm gonna do my best. Okay, so um, I'm gonna share something with you guys this morning. It's gonna be a little different, right? You guys are so used to our amazing pastor speaker. He's such a great speaker. I was just telling Tech, how does he memorize that stuff? I don't know how he does that. Like he doesn't really have a lot of notes. He's just a great, great speaker. I gotta have my notes. That's the way it is, right? But um, I, this is not like a three-point message that I have for you guys today. I love to preach, I love to teach, but this is different. This is something that God has been kind of like bubbling up in me for a while now for King's Chapel. And I just really want to share um, what he's been speaking into my heart for King's Chapel. Um, when Tech and I first came here, actually, uh, it's really... I won't share all of our history, but we had been looking for churches for a while and visiting different places, and we found some very nice places. There's nothing wrong with, you know any of those churches. Um, just it wasn't the place where God was speaking to us to go, to congregate. So when we came here, I, kind of randomly too, uh, I remember the first service, I remember feeling the very sweet presence of the Lord, much like this morning. And I thought to myself, this is good. When you feel the sweet presence of the Lord in a church, that's a good sign, right? It's a very good sign. And the next thing that came to me immediately was this word potential. And it just started like stirring in my heart, this word, this potential. There's so much potential. There's so much that God could do. There's so much. And it just started stirring it in me and just kind of growing it from there. Pretty soon he started speaking to me about new life. I remember when it was close to spring, God started speaking to me about gardening and I saw this picture of him as a gardener and he was pruning his body and um, just getting everything ready for the, the new life that was coming. And I just kept hearing new, there's something new, 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 new. <laughs> and I was like, okay, God. So I just was praying, 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 praying about it. And I was talking to our pastors about it and just sharing, you know, as much as I could. And um, it's just been on my heart. And a couple of Sundays ago, a little while ago, we were, I was up here, we were singing, and during kind of the end of worship time, all of a sudden, God said to me, 
I did not share this at the moment. <laughs> he said to me, Megan, the season of adoration is over and the season of seeking is here. And I was like, I'm not saying that. People are going to think I'm crazy. <laughs> I was like, because there's nothing wrong with adoring the Lord, right? That's like, we're, I mean, that's amazing. Worshiping God is amazing. So I didn't say anything and it wasn't for the moment, so that was okay. But it like stuck in me, right? And then pretty soon God starts speaking to me about seasons, and about new seasons. And I just saw King's Chapel like walking down this path and going down this path, down this path. And all of a sudden, God was saying, take a turn now. Take a turn because there's something new. It's a new season. You know, it's funny. I remember my dad when I was in high school and I was graduating, him saying to me, Megan, all things that grow must change, right? It's nature, everything around us, right? Just like what Ava was just talking about. They change, they grow, they move, they work in seasons, right? So God works in our lives individually in seasons, but he works in us as a body in seasons as well. So I wanna talk a little bit about seasons. Have you, has anybody ever lived in a place where there is not, there are like not a lot of change in the seasons? Have you guys ever lived? I know some of you, huh? <laughs> so I don't know about you guys, but I mean, I love my nice tropical weather. Don't get me wrong, right? But there's something about the movement of the seasons that makes you feel like you're moving forward. Time is moving. Things are happening. You're growing. Things are changing. But sometimes when there's no change in the seasons, you start to feel a little um, comfortable sometimes. Do you know what I mean? You just kind of get like settled in maybe. And you start to get to feeling a little too comfortable, a little too satisfied with that place where you're at. And I'll tell you, we can see throughout the Bible, that is not good. <laughs> Being too comfortable in your season is not good because you will not want to move forward and you will not want to leave. And God will be right there next to you saying, let's move it along. Come on, come on. There's something different. There's something new. But we're just too comfortable to get out of our chairs and, and make that step. Are you with me? Okay, so... I should, before we go any further, I should tell you guys, I kind of am like a feedback type of a person here. So I'm gonna need to, to hear a little bit of evidence of you being with me today, <laughs> okay? I'm one of those people. So, okay, can you turn with me to Song of Solomon? I know, it's a strange book to preach from. <laughs> I love Song of Solomon. While you're going there, let me just recommend doing a Great study of Song of Solomon. It's amazing. I love this book. Changed my life. God did so much and has done so much in my life through this book. Chapter 5. So the same day that God spoke to me about the season of adoration and the season of seeking starting, the adoration being over and seeking beginning. I went to sit back down and all of a sudden, God starts speaking to me about all of these things. And I hear him saying to me that we need to be like the Shulamite. I don't know, probably most of us know Song of Solomon, right? Is King Solomon and this relationship he has with the Shulamite who of all all the crazy wives that he took and all the women, the Shulamite was like his favorite, right? So I love Song of Solomon because an act, it's an actual story, but it's also a wonderful allegory of our relationship with Christ. And some people will probably have different opinions about that. I think it's both because I think God's big enough to do that personally. So, all right. So let's read a little bit about what, um, what happens with the Shulamite and Song of Solomon. Are you with me so far? Oh, yes, thank you. I hear some voices. <laughs> okay, verse one. I have come into my garden, my sister, my bride. I have gathered my myrrh with my spice. I have eaten my honeycomb and my honey. I have drunk my wine and my milk. Eat, O oh, friends, and drink. Drink your fill, O oh, lovers. Okay, now, hear what the Shulamite says. I slept but my heart was awake. 
listen. My lover is knocking. Open to me, my sister, my darling, my love, my flawless one. My head is drenched with dew, my hair with the dampness of the night. I have taken off my robe. Must I put it on again? I have washed my feet. Must I soil them again? So here comes the king knocking on her door. She's already cleaned up for the night. She's gone to bed. She's relaxing. And here all of a sudden, the desperate pounding of the king outside her door. And what is her answer? Does she jump up and say, come in, I've missed you so much? She does not. She does not. She says, for real? I just went to bed. <laughs> like, this is the time you come? I already took my bath. I washed my feet. I'm clean. I'm in bed. You're going to make me get up again? That is her answer, right? Okay. So for those of us that are married, probably those who, of us who have been married even longer will understand, like the most time will understand this. Do you remember when you were dating, barely starting dating, and the phone would just ring and you'd be like running to get it because you just knew it was them calling you, right? Do you remember that? The excitement when you were getting ready for that date, you were like, you know, how do I look? Getting all dressed and ready. Do you remember that, that kind of like passionate excitement that you felt? And then something happens as time goes on and you get married, time passes by. You don't love them less. You don't love that person any less. But you kind of get comfortable in your love. Do you know what I mean? You get comfortable in that relationship. You know, my husband just asked me the other day, we were over at my cousin's house and... Um, some friends of my cousins were there, and they were teenagers. And I guess this, her, this girl's boyfriend wanted to go see a movie that night. It was Christmas Day. And she got upset with him for leaving to go see a movie and not hanging out with her family. And my husband said, is that normal? Like, why is she getting upset with him? I'm like, well, when you're first dating, you know how it is. You want to be together all the time. And, you know, girls kind of, it's important to them and stuff. But as you get married longer, you're like, yes, go see a movie. I'll see you later. <laughs> you know, do you know what I'm saying? It's just not that big of a deal because you're comfortable and you're secure in your love. There's nothing wrong with that. That's perfectly healthy, I think. I mean, as long as you don't, you know, go crazy and never see each other. You know what I mean. You get comfortable in your love for one another. And that's exactly what happened to this Shulamite here. She got comfortable. She wasn't excited when the king came knocking she was just comfortable in their love. She knew he wasn't going to stop loving her just because she didn't come to the door that night. She wasn't worried that something was going to happen and she, he would never speak to her again. She was just comfortable. There was no need to really get up. Come back tomorrow. I'm, I'm just already in bed. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. All the married couples are like, yep, pretty much. <laughs> uh, but it's the same way in our relationship with the Lord. It's so easy to get so comfortable based on the relationship that we've had so far, the things that we've experienced so far. All wonderful things, great things. We just were singing, right? Oh, how I've proved you over and over and over. We remember those things. And we're secure in our love with the Lord. But sometimes we get a little too comfortable. And we lose some of that passion. We lose some of that desire for our love. And we just kind of hunker down. It's okay to come to church, seeing about how wonderful God is, there's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> Please do not misunderstand me. Nothing wrong with that. But if the king is knocking, saying, open up, I 
don't want to just have the experiences that we've had so far. I want to have more experiences. There's something more. Will you open the door? Or are you too comfortable with our routines and our patterns and our very comfy Christianity? You with me? Okay. <laughs> no one's going to throw any tomatoes at me yet, right? <laughs> so what does the king do? What happens? What does she say? My lover thrust his hand through the latch opening, and my heart began to pound. <laughs> Love that. I rose to open for my lover, and my hands dripped with myrrh, and my fingers with flowing myrrh on the handles of the lock. I opened for my lover, but what happened? My lover had gone. He had left. He was gone. My heart sank for his departure. So the king knocked, and the Shulamite said, yeah, I'm just kind of tired right now. I'll see you tomorrow. He knocked again. Like, hey. And it says he thrust his hand. I just can imagine like, hm, I'm serious. Open the door. I'm desperate. And suddenly she, it's like she has this awakening, right? And she realizes, what am I doing? I love this person. What am I doing? So she gets up. She runs to the door and opens it, but... There's no one there. He had left. He was like, okay. I'm not going to force the door open. I'm not going to force my way in. If you don't want to let me in, that is your choice. I will let you make your choice. Which is just how Jesus works, right? God doesn't force himself on us. He doesn't make us do things that we don't want to do. We have a will. We get to choose. You know, I always tell people, like, you will go in your relationship as far as you want to go in your relationship with the Lord. You will get as much as you want. You will experience him as much as you want. Because God is there, always knocking, saying, I've got something, I've got something, I've got something. But he's not going to make you take it. He's not going to make you experience it. Are you with me? Did you see what I'm saying? He's knocking. He's not going to force it on you. So we know she jumps up. She goes looking for him desperately. And we know, I'm not going to read all of it because I'm not really getting into all the depth of Song of Solomon here. You know, she goes and she looks for him and the watchmen in the city beat her and all of these things happen. But then something really interesting happens in the book of Song of Solomon. When you get down to she's, you know, desperately looking for him. And look at verse 9. All of a sudden, you know, you've got your beloved, you've got your friends, you've got your lover. And all of a sudden, for the first time, the friends say something specific, something specific. How is your beloved better than others, most beautiful of women? How is your belover, beloved better than others that you charge us so? She's desperately seeking the king. She is running around town in the middle of the night, getting beat by watchmen to try and find this man. That's kind of intense. That is desperation, is it not? I don't think, love my husband, I'm not sure I would do that, <laughs> right? I mean, this is really intense, desperation on her part. So all of a sudden, the people around her begin to say, who is this guy? Who is this guy? He must be pretty amazing if you're so desperate to find him. Before in Song of Solomon, we see them saying, oh, good for you. You found love. Oh, that's awesome. Wonderful. So nice. And now all of a sudden they're saying, who is he? Who is this guy? Because her desperation affected the people around her. And it's the exact same way. 
We want to know why we don't have people filling up the churches. <laughs> it's not for lack of good messages. It's not for lack of beautiful singing. It's because as a body of believers, and I'm speaking in generalities here, we have stopped seeking Jesus and we are just talking about him and singing about him. We're singing about how wonderful he is. Don't get me wrong. And we're teaching about how good he is and how we need to be good Christians and how we're supposed to act and all of these things, all good things. But we have let desperation float away in our comfort of the past relationship we've had with the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that is not what God desires because he is alive and he is fresh every day. The Bible tells us that his mercies are new every morning. He's not boring. We, we should not ever be bored in church. That is sad because Jesus and definitely the Holy Spirit are not boring. Are you with me? If we're bored, maybe Jesus is knocking and we're saying, eh, I'm kind of comfortable here right now. What you're asking is a little scary. I don't understand that. I, I'm comfortable with what we've had so far, but that new step, mm, that makes me a little nervous. I don't quite understand it. I don't know how to categorize it. I don't know what box to put it in. I don't know how to act. I don't know what to do. Sometimes it's scary when something is new, right? There's been a lot of times in my life as Christ has been helping me to break down some of the um, religious training that I was taught growing up. Right? If you've grown up in the church, you probably understand me. Right? Not everything we teach all the time is straight from the Bible. Sometimes it's stuff that we have created and we take the Bible and like put our spin on it and then be like, act like this. Do you see what I'm saying? Right? You, you've experienced some of those things. And as, as Jesus began breaking some of those things down for me, that was scary. Because a lot of those things I was taught were serious. It's, it's scary. <sighs> you know, some of you know I was actually married before. I was married to a Venezuelan and did not go well. After a couple of years, he, you know, things happen and instead of dealing with stuff, he felt the need to get a girlfriend. So that wasn't really cool with me. So clearly, you know. But I remember because I tried, I tried and I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. I did spiritual warfare, I, you know, everything. What I felt like I was supposed to do as a good Christian in that situation. But there came a moment where God had to help me release that thing. But that was scary because I was taught divorce is like an unforgivable type of a sin. It was scary. It took me a long time to be able to let go, and I just dragged out that pain, you know, you know. But it was scary to take a new step as God tried to help me to see things differently and understand his word. Sometimes that knocking can be a little scary. <laughs> and it's just so much easier to come to church, sing our songs, pay our tithes, do our different ministries, go home, 
Everything's okay. Do you see what I'm saying? There's nothing wrong with any of that. There's nothing wrong. It's wonderful to meet together as a church, as a body, right? And to sing about Jesus, to sing to Jesus, pay our tithes, we do all of our things, whatever. All of those things are fine and great. But is that all we want? Is that it? Because I just feel the Lord saying, there's more than that. There's more. There's more than that. And as we start seeking God, and he starts showing up, because that's what he wants to do, who can resist that? Do you know what I mean? And people see it. People feel it, and they start saying, what is this? This isn't what I've been seeing all my life about Christianity. Go to church, do your good deeds, talk about Jesus. This is something different. You're doing something different here. What is this? Are you with me? Still? Okay. <laughs> has so much more for us as a body as a church so much more Tony you can come up I'm not going to preach for a super long time today I want to give us a chance to even just respond to this word but <sighs> you know it's so interesting God, he just knows. God, God works all things out, right, for our good. He just is ordering things and doing what he knows, just like, you know, we're talking about he works behind the scenes, he's doing his thing, and you're just kind of like, okay, walking along in the path that he's laying out, right? <clears throat> I've just been so burdened, so burdened for the church at large. I mean, for the church at large, because we need Jesus. <laughs> we need more of Jesus. <sighs> Comfortable Christianity isn't doing it. We might as well be some other <laughs> religions. <laughs> we have Jesus, we're saved. Is that the end of it? Do you see what I'm saying? There's so that's the beginning. That's the beginning of it. That's the beginning. There's so much more. But if we don't get hungry for it, if we don't allow the spirit to stir our hearts, miss it in our church busyness in our Christian busyness we're going to miss the new the deeper things that God wants to do in our lives as individuals and as a church as a body of believers we're going to miss it I don't want to miss it I don't want to miss that I want more <laughs> you know when I was a teacher I used to tell my students that we're kind of like pirates as Christians. Good pirates, of course. <laughs> Not the bad kind. And Jesus is a treasure. He just wants us to go on a treasure hunt. <laughs> he just wants us to find him, to look for him, to dig, to seek. And he is there ready, waiting to be found. You know, I've, I've been praying so much for our pastors. 
because I know that they have this in their heart. I know that they do. And they want more. But they're only one part of this body. They're the leaders of our body. But if we don't want to go, then we're not going. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? If we say, no, God, we're good. We're comfortable. We love you. This is fine. This is where we're going to stay and hunker down in this season. And we're going to stay here for forever and ever and ever. Then that's what we're going to do. Because we choose. And probably eventually, God will take our pastors somewhere else. And the opposite is true as well. If we want to go and they don't want to go, then God's going to take that care of that too. Because anybody, anybody who wants more can find more. Anybody. God is no respecter of persons. And he is hungry always to meet with us and connect with us and speak to us. And anybody who wants it can get it, can tap into that well, dip their cup in and drink from that fountain. Anybody.